Good morning, everybody. This is Grant from State of the Spark, and I am super pumped you're here. I'm really pumped for today's show because we're going to tell you how far, how you can measure how far you can go. I'll also tell you how to get there. We're going to be covering that. We're also going to share with you how what is J.R.R. Tolkien's middle name and show you a little bit of his art. Also, you'll learn who is the god of sowing seed, wealth, and liberation. We're going to be covering all of that. But before any of that, you know what we're going to be covering. Morning cup of gratitude. What are you grateful for this morning? TGIM. Thank God it's Monday. Thank God it's Monday because we can go out there and tackle this world. We can go out and tackle this week. We can excitedly share what we're creating with the world. What are you grateful for this morning? Tell me in the comments. And you know I'm going to start with what I'm grateful for. I am, without a doubt, absolutely, absolutely grateful for my community this week. I'm grateful for my community this week. That includes some of these crazy people, Trey and Atenea Smith, Jamie and Natalia Clemens, Jessica and Jesse Simpson, Stephanie of Buena Market, James and Dory Joseph, and so many, many, many others that I don't have time to list here, but specifically I name these folks because we had such a blessing in our life this last week. Uh, we had such a towny Saturday. It wasn't funny where we woke up and saw another part of our community, Jen Smur and Michael MacArthur. Uh, Jen Smur, founder and owner of Born and Bread Bakery. They had their, I think, a uh, seventh year anniversary. And we were there to celebrate with them, hanging out with Mayor Mutz and his family, hanging out with James and Dory over croissants and cruffins for breakfast, just fellowshipping with our awesome, awesome community on a beautiful Saturday morning. We do not pause often enough and, and, uh, and just experience the gratitude we have for being able to see people we know and shake hands with people we know and just celebrate someone's successful business, but really celebrating community. And then it went on in the evening where Marissa and I we're walking around the Buena Market, downtown Lakeland, and we had a stellar time. And I even turned to her and said, I wonder what Jamie and Natalia are doing tonight. And sure enough, there they were, fellowshipping with other parts of their community uh, and just having empanadas and watching the kids dance and hang out and roller skating. Stephanie and Lake brought roller skating to Buena Market, and it was such a celebration. We had such a good time. And then we had a little bit of a moment where our community was able to support us as well. And so it was such an awesome evening. And I am so, so full of gratitude for the people. I told Marissa, I said all day long, I was just filled up with gratitude for the people. That is what I'm grateful for. And it's a reminder. This is part of today's show, a reminder of how you measure how far you can go and how to get there. And I'll tell you right now, if you got to hang up and go to work, I'll tell you the answer right now so that you're not missing anything. The answer is people. We're going to be talking about more of that. Hey, no matter what you do, make sure you check out the Discord, the Patreon, the new book, uh, Spark to Top 100 Dream Igniter. That link is in the comments below. I'd be honored if you took a look at that. But no matter if you don't, let's talk about other news. News that'll make you smarter. Let's talk about it. So aside from all the other crazy things going on in the world, I want to share a little bit with you of one of my favorite writers, mythologists, philologists, linguists, map makers on the planet, calligrapher artist, J.R.R. Tolkien. Now, not only is Tolkien the author of the epic saga, Lord of the Rings, as well as The Hobbit, which I found out is also longer than I originally thought it was. I thought The Hobbit, for some reason, was just a single book, but no, it's its own it's its own epic. Not only was J.R.R. R. Tolkien, author of Lord of the Rings, author of The Hobbit, The Cimmerillion, all of these books which have tantalized my fantasy life for so many years. Turns out, and I didn't even really know this, he's also an artist. Now, I did know that a lot of the original sketches and the original print for the books did come from Tolkien. I knew that he was a sketcher. Uh, if not a drawer. But I did not know he was also an artist. So in today's art news, we're talking very briefly about J.R.R. Tolkien. Now, I promised this in the title of today's show. So do you know what R.R. Tolkien? Don't look it up. Can you guess? I'm going to give you three seconds to guess 
what J.R.R. Tolkien's middle letters, middle names are without looking it up. And the person to post it in the next three seconds, I'll give you a free copy of my book. No one posted it. J. Ronald Royal. I'm probably butchering that. Raul Ruel. Ruel. We'll go with Ruel. J. Ronald Ruel Tolkien. Now, I don't know what the origins are, and him being the linguist and philologist, I'm sure he could explain quite clearly where he's from. You see, Tolkien is state published a horde. Yes, I'm pulling that word from his book in terms of a dragon treasure horde. Tolkien Estate published a hoard of his art and drawings and a published book, which is coming out soon. It was originally published in 1955, uh, so published way back in the day, if you will. It's over 70 years ago. But you can actually see that here, and I am tempted to pick up this book myself because, A, I love the artwork. But if you click through, I'm going to drop the link here for you. If you click through to this, you can actually see his style, which was a little cartoony but a little fantasy. You can get a hold of that right there. So check that out. And why I love Tolkien was he's a mythologist. He created an entire world and he often said, the myths of our day are fading. And uh, Joseph Campbell rightly said, when a society lets go of its myths, the society is crumbling. And today we don't have myths. And if you look around, there's a lot of signs that our society probably needs to reform into something a little more uh, tidy. Uh, By that, I mean It looks, for all intents and purposes, that our society is crumbling in so many ways, but we can pull this together by having new myths. And speaking of new myths, let's talk about who is the god of sowing seeds. In other brief news, I did not know this. I thought this person was the god of war for so many reasons. And I'm going to have to re-look and and, and re-dust off the Wikipedia article on this deity. But in the eastern sky this morning, you will see the rise of Venus and Mars, and it is joined by, I'll give you three seconds to guess, three seconds to guess, and the first person to guess, if you guess within the next three seconds, you'll get a copy of my book. (gasps) No one guessed. That's all right. It's Saturn. I always thought Saturn was the god of war, and I do not know why I thought that, but that is anchored in my brain. Turns out that is not true. And this is symbolic for today. You want to talk about myth. I want you to grab this myth for your heart on this Monday. I want you to grab this myth on your heart for this Monday. The god of renewal, the god of sowing seed, the god of liberation and renewal and new generations, and the god of plenty and wealth, that's the god of Saturn. And just so you know, this morning, it's beautiful out. We've got a beautiful morning this morning out there. The the sky is clear. The temperature is pristine. It's spring, which is probably why Saturn rises on dawn, at dawn, in spring. And I want you to take the symbolism deep to heart. I want you to pause. The God of renewal, the God of sowing seed, the God of plenty, the God of wealth, the God of regeneration, the God of abundance is rising in the eastern sky this morning, along with Venus, along with Mars. And you can see them with the naked eye. Now, fun fact, the god of Saturn correlated in the Greek, so the god Saturn is a Roman god, it correlated in the Greek to the god Kronos. Now, what we know about Kronos is this. You got to catch this symbolism. Kronos was a titan, and his reputation was uh, a consumer. And if you think about the symbolism to the Greeks, Time, chronological time, consumes its own children. And Kronos consumed its own children. It's kind of a dark, macabre sort of depiction of this god, Kronos. And he would give birth to children, but in order to survive, in order for time to proceed, it would consume its own children. Think about the life cycle. Think about, in fact, that's what the Enso is all about. Think about the life cycle of birth. And you give birth, and you're born into this beautiful thing called time, but given enough time. We also have to then face the other side, death. And it's scary and frightening. And that's a darker view of Kronos. Well, it's quite interesting that the same, the the opposite side of the same coin, Saturn, is the god of plenty, the god of abundance, the god of wealth. How interesting that we often view the time and the god of time as a consumer of the things it gives birth to. But we often forget that the correlate in the Romans is the god of Saturn 
And this is the person who does not consume its children, but gives birth to generations and wealth and plenty. And that's what we're having on yesterday was the first day of spring. It's spring. And if you look out into the east and enjoy the sunrise, just before sunrise, you can see Venus, Mars, and Saturn. And you can watch them rise with the naked eye. And then towards the end of the month, keep looking because you'll also catch a crescent moon in this beautiful astronomical display. But I also want to make sure that you catch the symbolism in your heart. Go out there and tell yourself the God of plenty, the God of abundance, the God of wealth is rising in the east. And he's rising on you and he's rising on me. Go outside, take a deep breath of that morning fresh air and just think about that and pray to infinite intelligence a prayer of gratitude for that very thing. The God of liberation is rising in the east. If you want a link to see what planets are rising this morning, let me drop this in the comments here for you. Boom, boom, there you have it. You can view that. Oh, I've just published the same darn link about Lord of the Rings. Oh, I apologize. I did. I published the same link about Lord of the Rings. I'll get you a better link about Saturn, the god of abundance, rising in the east, and I'll drop it in the comments later. Thanks for your grace on that. And not only are we talking about the god of plenty, wealth, and abundance, we're going to talk about a form of wealth and abundance that you couldn't beat with a stick and how this form of wealth and abundance allows you to actually measure, and I'm going to give you this, an actual way to measure how far you can go in here in this life. And that measurement is also the secret on how to reach it. Let's talk about it. Mm, 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 mm. Fun fact, talking about J.R.R. Tolkien, an etymologist, a person who loved words, and I love words. J.R.R. Tolkien, a philologist, a person who studied language, a linguist, a person who invented language of the dwarves and language of the elves, he would know the root meaning of the word wealth. The word wealth comes from the root word wheel, W-E-A-L. I believe it has Germanic roots, if I'm not mistaken. And wheel had all the connotations that you and I know as wealth. Now, when I say wealth, you probably picture gold. When I say wealth, you might even be an abundant person and picture your children. When I say wealth, you might picture resources and cars and homes or vacations or abs. Wealth had over 13 different measures where the word came from. The word wealth had over 13 different metrics and measures. But the main one it had was the very thing we're going to measure how far you can go. I want to just ask you a question, and that question is simply this, and I've already given this to you in the beginning of today's episode. The question is who, not how. You see, Dan Sullivan wrote a great book by the same title, Who, Not How. In the world of entrepreneurship, being an entrepreneur coach, and not just an entrepreneur coach. Yes, I've coached some entrepreneurs, but I'm a personal development coach, and it just so happens that for those who are pursuing freedom, which is most people, oh, my dude, Billy Weigel. I love seeing your face. I love your energy. For those who don't recall, I interviewed Billy uh, a few weeks ago, and you can go watch his episode on our YouTube channel in a variety of places. Uh, Billy, to answer your question, my sir, uh, Wednesday should be good of the following week. I'll get with you offline. The book by Dan Sullivan, Who, Not How, is the absolute key to measuring how far you can go and exactly how to get there. You see, as a personal development coach, um, I get involved with a lot of entrepreneurs. And as I was saying, um, getting involved in entrepreneurs, what you find out is that quite often, they first and foremost got involved in entrepreneurship because those who believe in freedom, those who pursue freedom, remember, we talked earlier about the God, the Roman God of liberation, which is freedom, the Roman God of abundance and wealth. Abundance and wealth all come from freedom. Right? It is for freedom he set us free, right? The God of abundance and freedom brought more into your life. And entrepreneurs pursue entrepreneurship not because they were born entrepreneurs, not because they believe in the God of business. They believe in time freedom. They believe in uh, mind freedom. They believe in the freedom of choice. They believe in autonomy and agency for their day, which, believe it or not, 
you might be shocked to find out. This creates a lot of individualized people, people that have an individualistic paradigm, people that absolutely think that they can do it on their own. Now, you and I have probably found out as entrepreneurs, as business owners, as, as leaders, as influencers, that you can't get anything done alone. But society, more than just cultivating those who pursue freedom, more than them cultivating an individualistic paradigm, what's worse than that is the myths of our society that are not necessarily healthy myths teach us that people can make it alone. The myths of our heroes, the myths of our industrialists, the myths of the Gary Vaynerchuks, the myths of the Tony Robbins did it alone. But if you ask these people, the first thing they will tell you is that there is no way I did this alone. And Billy Weigel's case, he came on, he came on a, a comment just a moment ago. He himself has confessed that it was his wife who has helped him get as far as he's gotten. And it's his mentors, the people around him, his broker dealers, these people who have gotten him as far as they have gotten him. In fact, he just did a live, I want to say a week or two ago, about some property in Coco he was looking at. He didn't suddenly come up with the leads and come up with the deals and close the deals cultivated relationships. I want to tell you how to measure how far you can go. How you can measure how far you can go is how far you're willing to reach out to others. Let's talk about how we can ask the question, who, who can get it done instead of how, how can I get all this done, which is a decent question. We're going to give you five quick principles that I want you to go into Monday with on how to reframe your brain. Yes, we need to ask the how question. We'll touch on that in a second. But we need to make sure that it does not stop there. We need to make sure that we ask the who question. I cannot emphasize enough to you that who you talk to, who you reach out to, who you run with, who you connect with, who you, who you envy, and I mean that in an abundant way, not in a jealousy way, not in a way where you wish ill upon someone else. I mean those who you look up to those who you honor for the successes in their life. Who is probably one of the most important questions you can ask in this life? How did I get here? That's a decent question. How do we get it done? How do I achieve more good questions that will open up your mind? But who is probably the most, most intelligent question you can ask? Let's give you the five quick principles. Number one, first and foremost, you do need to begin with the question, how? to woe, to know what is needed. How is it done is the first question you should ask. How is this thing? How is this goal? How is real estate investment typically done? That's why we have the show. That's why I interview people like Billy Weigel. That's why I'm going to be interviewing the cryptography, the cryptocurrency uh, chair or uh, department head at Indiana Wesleyan University. Hopefully we can get that uh, scheduled and locked in the books. How does this actually work? You should have an innate curiosity about the world around you. How is real estate done? How is freedom actually managed? If you don't know this yet about State of the Spark, about me, Grant Sparks, and Marissa, my wife, if you don't know this about us, we're living our life as an experiment. To answer the question, it's an important question. How does this work? How does freedom work? How does liberty work? How does living on the island in the Dominican Republic work? We've answered that question for ourselves. For Marissa, how does becoming a scuba dive instructor actually work? How does doing long distance hiking work? All questions Marissa asks. She's asking herself right now, how can I lead better? It's a great question. How can I grow my companies? How can I be a better partner for my partners like Adam Welcher with Spark Billing? He's doing so much good with becoming a billing payment processor for small businesses. How do these things work? Innate curiosity leads the human species forward. But the downside to this is quite often because humans do fool themselves into thinking that they are an individual. Fun fact, you being an individual is an illusion. It's a healthy evolutionary illusion. It's a reflection of the divine inside of you, but only one aspect of the divine inside of you. We can talk more about that another time. Number one, ask how. Yes, it's a good question. But if you stop there, it will begin and end with you. And that's where most entrepreneurs get off track. If you ask the how question and then your only answer is, how can I do this? I would actually say is, how can this be done? If you want a better question for your subconscious brain in order to manifest better, ask the question, how can this be done? And don't answer, don't presume 
that the answer is you. Second question, ask who can do it. Asking who helps you figure out who can develop, deliver what is needed. Who can do it? Who is best at this? And the answer is quite often not you. There are 8 billion and growing people on this planet. And probabilities wise, you are not the best person to execute, specifically execute that thing. Who can I afford to get it done is also a good question because you may or may not be able to afford the best. But if the first question is how, if you stop there, you'll hit a rut. But you then need to ask the obvious next question. Who can do it? Now, that's the second question to ask. But bear with me. Because your thought process is not done for going as far as you can go. Remember, my promise in the title is how can you measure the furthest you can go? Now, quite often, I have met some entrepreneurs who have not gone as far as they can go. And they have asked the who question. Who's the best in the world at this thing? But quite often, they suddenly then give up. Because the question is, is I can't afford that person. Is that true? Quite often, if you actually look at an entrepreneur's thought cycle, if you look at an entrepreneur's thought cycle and they ask, who can get this done? And then they go to that person. That person says, well, I'm good at this. I'm better than you at it. And here's my price ticket. And then they go, I can't afford that. Recently, in the last three months, I had someone who said, hey, man, I talked to a friend and I knew the friend. And they said, my business, um, I need a website. And we have a website company. And uh, they said, uh, this person said you could get that done. I said, I could absolutely get it done. Tell me about the project. They said, well, how do you work? I said, well, my, what, my low-end website costs $2,200. We do a done-for-you website at $3,200, which means you have a marketing-ready website. There's a bunch that goes into that. And they said, oh, my friend said you build websites for $500. And I said, yes, seven and a half years ago when I built their website. <laughs> we were just getting started. We did it cheap. This entrepreneur said, no, I'll figure out how to get it done myself. And the clock starts ticking on when that company is going to end, not because of a website. The clock starts ticking on when that company is going to end because of the founder's paradigm. That leads us to the third principle. The first question is, is asking, okay, I got to ask, how does this get done? How is a good website built? How is a good billing solution done? How can we invest in more real estate? How do we compound our investment money? Great questions. Who is the right answer? Who knows how it can be done? I had a massive real estate question. We were looking at a $7 million property in North Carolina this week, and we've done some property, my wife and I, but this was bigger than anything we had done yet. And I knew that. You got to know your limits. So I called my friend, Chris. Chris McLaughlin, he's a fantastic friend. We've walked the lakes before. He has poured into my life. I've enjoyed the times that we've had together. We did a venture smart crypto coach back in the day, back in 2017 together. It was a fantastic time. And I know Chris because he... I went to Chris about this question because he owns the Keller Williams in the area. They've done billions in listings over the last few years. It's fantastic. It's been impressive what they have done. So I had a question about real estate and I went to him. Who knows how to get it done? And this man spoke into my life and I owe him. I owe him more than I could pay him. I owe him more than I could pay him because he saved me a lot of heartache, just giving me a little bit of advice. That leads us to the third point. Be willing to give up more of the pie. Now, I know that makes a lot of penny pinchers choke. I know a lot of small businesses are doing less than 80 grand a year. This is facts. Go look up the SBA statistics. Uh, if you look up the SBA statistics, most small businesses make less than $100,000 a year. Most. If you have a product or service, sidebar, if you have a product or service and that product or service costs more then the average small business making $100,000 or less can afford, you're not going to go anywhere if you're targeting small businesses. You can target narrower niches. But if you are claiming to generally serve small businesses, you got to watch your pricing because it would shock people to realize that most small businesses make far less than hundred or make less than $100,000 a year. The third point is this, be willing to give up more of the pie. For those small business owners who are barely breaking $100,000 a year in their small business, you might choke when I say be willing to give up more of the pie, but if you want to grow, you have to invest not where uh, at a ratio of not where you're at, but where you're going. Too many of small businesses from the beginning are hoarding too much of the pie. 
you got to be willing to share more. Well, Grant, if I'm sharing more, I'm going to have to sacrifice. That is literally the best advice I got as an entrepreneur was this. If you don't have it in the tank to go for two years with being underpaid, you probably don't need to start that yet. Whether it's having two years of savings or two years of investor dollars or two years of whatever, or two years of residual income coming in. If you don't have that, don't launch because you're going to have to give up more of the pie to lure more people. Yes, you need to protect your intellectual property. Yes, you need to ensure that you have a profit margin, but you have to be willing to share more in order to buy the expertise of who knows how to do it best. Ask yourself, how does it need to be done? But then go immediately to who knows how to do it best and then be willing to give up more of the pie. I want you to remember this quote. This is point number four. I want you to remember this point. Ooh, Billy, paying attention here. Billy says, come from contribution. What I live by in life and in business has been such a great trait to embody because it will always seems to lead to growth. If you can contribute to other people's lives, and it doesn't always have to be cash. People are getting burnt out of being promised equity. 0% of zero revenue is still zero. And people feel that, but you have to at least be willing to put it out there. Someone out there will value the experience. Someone out there will value the equity. Someone out there with 8 billion people, you keep needing to ask the question how. Michael Michalowicz was very good at this. If you listen to Clockwork, fantastic book, go listen to the audio book because he has, has extra material in that book. And he gives you insight on how he does hiring when he might not have the cash to hire. Fantastic book. I want you to remember this quote, number four. I'm going to say this quote and you're going to be like, I remember this quote. I heard it. I want you to meditate on this. And it's this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. If you want to go fast, go it alone. If you want to go far, go together. Marissa and I daydream. I fantasize about being able to do long-term hikes with Marissa. One of the benefits of uh, hiking with a partner is you can split the weight on tents, on a Bunsen burner, on food. You can split the weight so that as you go, your backpacks get lighter quicker. And you start out with a lighter pack, generally speaking. Or you could pack more of other amenities because you share a sleeping bag if you care to. Or maybe not a sleeping bag, but a tent. <laughs> Remember this quote, point four, remember the quote. If you want to go fast, go it alone. If you want to go far, go together. Fantastic quote. I want you to anchor that into your brain. Here's my last point and I'll leave you with this. And this is the summary of today's promise. I promised you, how do you measure how far you can go? Here's the answer. The furthest you can go is measured by how far you are willing to go to reach out to others. Let me say that one more time for the people in the back, and I'm gonna copy and paste this right into the chat so you can own this and you know, you heard it here first. The furthest you can go is measured by how far you are willing to reach out to others. I want you to meditate on that today. Let me remind you of something. Let me remind you of this. You think you're hustling. You think you are grinding for some wealth, some thing, some trip, some Instagram post that you can share. Maybe you're enlightened. Maybe you are enlightened. And you think that you are hustling and grinding even for freedom. Now, we could unpack freedom and talk about Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning and how freedom can happen in a concentration camp. So freedom doesn't mean necessarily political freedom. If you go back to all the great teachers from Jesus to Gandhi, all these people spoke of an internal freedom. In fact, if anything, if you look at Jesus, he said, why, why are you resisting? Turn the other cheek. He had, he had no political aims if you actually read the text. Gandhi did. But this all came out, any external freedom all comes out of and begins with an internal freedom. But here's the paradox about internal freedom. Internal freedom can only 
be measured and enjoyed when shared. It's like love. You can love yourself, and there's all this great messaging about there. Love your body. Love yourself. Don't self-shame. Don't body shame. Get rid of imposter syndrome. I believe in all of that. But that is the starting point of something that should happen for this species. The species is unique in that we'll invade another country and kill our brethren and try to fool the very people that we have enlisted to kill others. In fact, if you look back through history, we have often had to fool people into killing other people because there's something in our species that knows that it is wrong to eat our own species. We're not Kronos eating our very own species. We're Saturn. And if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to the beginning of today's show and watch what I said about the god of Saturn being the Roman inverse opposite of the god, um, uh, of the god Kronos in the Greek mythology. We're not made to consume our own children as Kronos was. We're made to be a provider and a god. Jesus said, I call you gods for so you are. We're supposed to be gods of our own abundance, gods of our own wealth. That means we're supposed to be creators of our own wealth, creators of our own abundance. The reason it's good to love yourself the reason it's good to get over imposter syndrome, the reason Marissa had a situation this week and, and it was a little embarrassing. She had some struggles, but the biggest struggle she had was sharing her vulnerability with others. And she's probably cringing me saying this and I won't tell you more about that, but that's an internal struggle most of us have. Most of us struggle to get vulnerable with other people. That is a component that I'd like for you to overcome because you only can go as far as you are willing to go to reach out to others, to be open to others. Whether it's Marissa's situation or my trying to grow this business or trying to grow the show, reaching out to my friend Joe and putting me in touch with the Indiana Wesleyan University head of their cryptocurrency department. I want to talk to more intelligent people. How far am I willing to go to reach out to other people? Not even to achieve but to generate flow, this species is cutting itself off because it's attacking itself. It's harming itself. It's, it's killing its fellow man. It's invading other countries or it's setting up false us or them paradigms. It's my religion versus yours. It's my church versus your secularism. It's my scientism versus your faith. We keep setting up these false barriers. And because of that, abundance ceases to flow. If you're looking for flow, you can look to nature as a model and as peace. You can look to nature to breathe easier. But actual flow only comes through other people. The right other people. The correct other persons. So why are we talking about asking who, not how? It's because that's just one manifestation of humans' tendency to fool ourselves that we're individuals and we can achieve what we need to achieve alone in a silo. If you want to feel community, it starts with you sowing vulnerability and love and appreciation for those people who are there to support you. Boom! <laughs> My man Billy says, hashtag grow the show grant. Let's get after it this week. Hey, you know what, Billy? Why don't you and I do a day a week Maybe Financial Freedom Fridays and just talk, banter about financial freedom. Let's talk about that, my brother. Hey, man, I'm going to let you all go today. I'm going to let you get about this week, but I want to remind you of something. Why do we do any of this? Why do we have State of the Spark? Why do we have State of the Spark? Why have we built any of these businesses? Why do I do this show? Why do I remind you? Who, not how? Because I want you to go through this week and remember and be equipped for, and having the tools and training, and to be educated, encouraged, and empowered to accomplish the mission. And that is igniting lives of explosive significance, starting with your own. Have a great day.